In November of 1962, author and publisher Francis Clive Ross made a trip to Cumberland, England, in search of a story. It wasn't a story he wanted to write, it was one he'd heard. A very strange and terrifying story about events that had been captured by another writer 60 years before. That writer was Augustus Hare. In his book, In My Solitary Life, Hare retold a tale that he himself had been told. This tale involved something that shouldn't exist. Francis Clive Ross was chasing a tale about a strange encounter with a vampire. On a long-ago spring day, two brothers and their sister arrived in Cumberland with the hopes of settling into a new home. Their last name was Cranswell, and they'd heard about Croglin Grange, a single-story building in Cumberland available for rent. The Fishers, who owned the property, were moving to a bigger place. When the Cranswells found Croglin Grange, they were elated. It was exactly what they were looking for, and they quickly settled in. If there was one thing about the property that gave Miss Cranswell a bit of a pause, it was the fact that the yard abutted a small churchyard. From her bedroom window, she could actually see the stones. Now, it wasn't a deal breaker, and her brothers assured her that there was nothing to worry about. It gave the place a peaceful atmosphere, and churchyards were, if nothing else, quiet. It didn't take the Cranswells long to get acclimated to life around Crogland Grange, and also the quaint village it was situated in. They were accepted and made the trip back and forth from the Grange to the village shops quite often. I also have no doubt that the two brothers acquainted themselves with the village's pub as well. Spring passed, and the warm days of summer crept in. At night, when the crickets were out, Miss Cranswell would listen to their distant orchestrations before drifting off to sleep. It was a routine she enjoyed. One night after spending some time with her brothers, Miss Cranswell retired to her bedroom, as was usual, and opened the window. The distant churchyard was bathed in shadow, and the crickets had resumed their nightly symphony. But there was something else. She wasn't quite sure at first, but something in the direction of the churchyard caught her attention. Was it a reflection of something? She stared intently into the darkness that had gathered where the Grange's lawn met the churchyard stone wall. There, she'd seen it again. Two small reflections of light. A cat, perhaps? Or some other nocturnal animal walking atop the stone wall. She'd seen cat's eyes capture the light of the moon before, so maybe that was it. But no, the two small glowing orbs weren't on top of the wall. They were beyond it within the churchyard itself, they passed above and between the dark shapes of the stones. They were too close together to be fireflies, too. Fireflies didn't move in unison. And furthermore, if these were eyes, they were moving closer to the stone wall. If they passed over it, they would soon be in her yard. She'd had enough. It had to be an animal, but whatever animal it was, she wanted nothing more to do with it. Nor did she want it creeping outside of her open window. So she shut it and went to bed. She felt a bit silly and considered opening her window again, but whatever it was she had seen drifting between the stones and toward their yard continued to disturb her. She pushed the images away, thought about the pleasant summer days ahead, and drifted off to sleep. Miss Cranswell bolted up in bed. Something was at her window. It was the glowing orbs. But now she could see them clearly. They were eyes. And the figure behind the eyes wasn't a cat or a dog or any other creature she had ever seen. It wasn't even a man. And it was scratching at her window. She wanted to scream for her brothers, but she was paralyzed with fear. If she remained quiet, 
perhaps it would become frustrated with the locked window and go away. And then, the creature hadn't just been scratching at her window, it had been picking at the lead that held the panes in place. Miss Cranswell watched in horror as a thin, bony hand reached in to unlock the window. And there it stood, in her room and above her bed. It took the shape of a man, but this was no man, not one she'd ever seen before. This was a demon with burning coal-like eyes and a pale face from a nightmare. It paused, smiled a ghastly smile, and was upon her. Alerted by their sister's blood-curdling scream, the brothers burst into her room. The scene was horrifying. Blood pumped from twin gashes in Miss Cranswell's neck where she lay unconscious. A stench that they couldn't identify filled the room. Whatever had attacked their sister had fled back through the open window. While one brother tended to their sister and her open wound, the other brother stood at the window, desperately trying to see where her assailant had fled to. There, by the churchyard. Was that a shadow? If it was, it was gone. The next day, they decided to leave. Miss Cranswell, while not fully recovered from the attack, was out of danger. As soon as she was feeling up to it, they would pack their bags and spend the rest of the summer in Switzerland. The air there would do her well. It would do them all well after what they had just gone through. Switzerland was idyllic. The events at Kroglin Grange seemed distant and a thing of the past. Miss Cranswell told her brothers what little she could and as much as she could remember. Being protective brothers, they were livid, and together decided that whatever it was that had crept through her window only weeks before, it had to pay for what it had done. So they would go back. She tried to convince them not to, but when it became obvious that pleading with them wouldn't work, she came up with a plan. She would allow herself to serve as bait for the creature. Her brothers protested, but she insisted. And so it was that the Cranswells found themselves once again passing the churchyard and through the front door of Croglin Grange. The weather had turned cold since they'd last been there. Miss Cranswell did exactly what she had done that fateful night not too many weeks before. She wanted to recreate it exactly. She stood at the window, allowing herself to be seen, and latched it. And then they waited. This time, Miss Cranswell didn't go to bed. She watched through the window as two glowing eyes once again appeared in the churchyard, passed over the stone wall, and approached the house. Just as before, it scratched loose a pane of glass and unlatched the window. This time, it was met by the two brothers. The creature howled and ran off into the night. The next morning, they were prepared. Whatever it was that had attacked their sister had retreated to the churchyard. The brothers gathered up some of the local men and the group descended upon the graveyard. At first, everything appeared in order. None of the graves appeared to have been disturbed and the grounds themselves were as they had always been. And then they noticed the crypt door. It wasn't completely shut. The scene inside was straight out of a nightmare. Coffins had been wrenched open and bones littered the floor. Some had obviously been chewed upon and snapped open to get at the marrow, or what little of it remained. Every coffin had been broken into. All that is, save one. They opened it. There, for all to see, was the thing that had crept up to Miss Cranswell's window the night before. Wearing tattered and moldy clothes, it appeared dead. Whatever demonic forces had animated it a few short hours ago was gone. There was no life left behind its eyes, none that they could see. One of the brothers pointed at its leg. There it was, a bullet wound where it had been struck before running off. Terrified at what they had found, they dragged the coffin out of the crypt, into the churchyard, and set it ablaze in the cool morning air. So, was the story captured in the pages of Augustus Hare's book real and not a tall tale told to him to entertain his readers? 
That's what Francis Clive Ross hoped to find out when he traveled to Cumberland in search of Croglin Grange and its churchyard. While he couldn't prove the story to be true, he could at least confirm the setting and perhaps gather more facts to support its retelling. What he found is this. After a series of interviews with the locals, Clive Ross found that there was a place called Croglin Low Hall in Cumberland. It was a two-story structure but had originally been a single-storied home until around 1720. Deeds revealed that it had, up until that time, been called Croglin Grange. There had also been a chapel nearby. The foundation stones remained, but that had long since been torn down. Any gravestones or crypt had long been lost to time as well. If true, he concluded, the attack on Miss Cranswell and the horrific discovery of the creature would have taken place sometime around 1680 to 1690. Even the descendants of the Fisher family, who had reportedly rented the Grange to the Cranswells, knew the story and had heard it told many times over the years. So had Croglin Grange been the site of a vampire attack? And if so, who had the vampire been in life? Writer Mark Alexander, who recently passed away at the age of 90, was a prolific writer and author of over 70 books. In 1978, he may have given the vampire an identity. A former Croglin rector confirmed the story of vampire attacks and went on further to say that a strange bat-like creature had been associated with the grave of a clergyman who served the village in the late 17th century. The clergyman's name was Reverend George Sanderson. Could he have been the vampire of Croglin Grange? I'll leave that to you to decide. Thank you for listening. I'm Rick Coast. And if you haven't already, please subscribe and leave a review. You can also help support the show by going to strangeencounters.org. I would love to hear from you. I would also love to hear your suggestions for future episodes. And until next time, please take care of yourself. It's a strange world out there. Sid Z. Sid. Nothing shown. I'm Lizzo and Ash in the. It's out.